This is a LUNT 100mm Universal Solar Telescope. And if you don't know this series of models, it's got a little bit of a surprise in store. So let's take a look. Okay, so I suppose this is as good a place as any to address this, so let's get this one out of the way. Unless you know what you're doing, please do not look at the sun. Without proper filtration, serious damage to your eyes can occur. And unless you know what you're doing, and you tend to know that you know what you're doing, please don't even think about looking at the sun. A couple of years ago, my friend brought a telescope to work with him in the car, and he left the lens cover off and went to work, and it was angled in such a way that the scope caught a little bit of the sun during part of the day. And when he got in his car at the end of the day, there were burn marks in the upholstery on the other side. Another time, a friend and I were looking at the sun through a four and a half inch F8 Newtonian, and we got to talking and lost track of what we were doing, and the person accidentally removed the solar filter from the front of the telescope. It was only off for a couple of seconds until we realized what was going on, put the solar filter back on, and just in that time, it had burned a hole in the eyepiece cap. So please practice safe solar, do not look at the sun unless you absolutely know what you're doing. Okay, so let's suppose you do want to look at the sun. Well, the simplest and cheapest way to do this is to get something called a white light filter. I've got a couple of these here. This one looks like it's made by Thousand Oaks. It's a piece of glass, looks like a mirror. And this one is made by somebody else, I don't know who, but this is a film that's in a holder here. And obviously you prefer the glass to the film because the film can tear. And let's say this one is built for my Takahashi FC100, and all you do is put that on the front there, and it is now safe to look at the sun. Now, for safety's sake, when we go out and do sky watches for people, we have a policy that not only does the filter have to be on the scope, but we want to see tape wrapped around here, usually duct tape or something, just to make sure it doesn't fall off, which is fairly unlikely, or in case some kid decides to get curious and take this thing off. So again, please practice safe solar. So if you do have one of these filters on your telescope, what it does is it takes all of the wavelengths of light coming from the sun and it brings them all down pretty much all at the same level, yeah, you know, more or less. And what you see is something like this. It's the disk of the sun. And if you're lucky, there are some sunspots out and you can look at those. And it's pretty interesting. So if you have a regular telescope, these filters cost anywhere from, you know, $50 US to $150 or so, depending on the size of your telescope. And I would recommend that you go ahead and do this because you're probably going to wind up getting one of these things anyway. And it's pretty interesting to look at the sun, you know, through your telescope that you're probably used to only taking out at night. So the downside of this white light filter is that it, you know, after a few minutes, it's actually not very interesting. It's still worth what you pay for it, but once you see the sunspots, it's, you know, not that much more to see after that. I do want to point out the obvious here, which is you're paying money to look at one object. With a telescope, you can look at many objects at night, but with the telescope and the solar filter on, you're looking at one object, and if there's nothing going on at that particular point in time on the one object, you're kind of just done for the afternoon. Okay, so let's say you want to take it to the next level. You've bought your white light solar filter, you're intrigued, but you want to do better. In that case, you need something like this. It's called an H-alpha solar telescope. And unlike the white light filter, which indiscriminately lowers all of the wavelengths of light and filters them all out, the H-alpha telescope is a band pass filter. It only lets through the bandwidth of light that allows you to see the sun and rejecting all of the other wavelengths actually helps because those tend to interfere and muck up what you're trying to see. So there's a filter here, there's a filter here, there's a filter here, very redundant here to make things safe. And if you look through here, the difference is dramatic. It is not subtle. So here is an image with white light and here is an image through H alpha. And again, there is just no contest. This is in just a huge leap in performance. 
Okay, so how does this thing work? Well, there's a filter here and you see these controls here. There is a normal focuser that you're probably used to seeing in a telescope, but these things are called etalons and there are two of them here. And since there are two of them, we, re we refer to this as being double stacked. You may also see this with only one of these on here. and We refer to that as being single stacked. Many beginners upon seeing this for the first time assume that this is some sort of sophisticated electronic dial or control. It is not. It's purely mechanical. It works off of pressure. And when you turn this in, the action on this is quite stiff, obviously, because everything is under pressure here. The change in pressure within the chamber, within the etalon, is enough to tune the image. And the reason you want to tune the image is because the correct tuning for the details on the surface of the sun is different from the tuning to see the prominences, the stuff at the edges. So when you're looking through a solar telescope, you're constantly fiddling with these controls and getting them to the point where you're seeing what it is that you want to see. So in single stack configuration, it is just an amazing experience compared to the white light version. When you put the second stack on, you know, it's said that once you see a double stacked telescope in solar H alpha configuration, you will never again want to go back to single stack. And yeah, you have much more precise control over what you're seeing. So you may be asking, well, if that's the case, why doesn't everybody double stack their telescopes? Well, there's this pesky little issue of the price. Depending on how you buy this particular telescope, you buy it in base configuration, it usually comes single stacked, and depending on what ac accessories you get with it, you're gonna be spending somewhere around $6,500 for the single stacked base configuration with some basic accessories. If you wanna add the double stack later, you can do that. This thing is all modular. I'm gonna take it apart here in a few minutes and show you how it works. The second stack module alone is 1800 US dollars. So what a lot of people do is they get the single stack version, play with it for a while, save up the money, get the second stack, and then you have a complete solar setup. So I'm gonna leave a link in the description to an excellent series of articles written by Andrew Lunt as to exactly how these etalons work. It is quite fascinating. So I said there is a surprise with this telescope. So with most other solar telescope configurations, what they'll do is they'll take a regular astronomical telescope and then they'll add a solar filter to it and they'll turn it into a solar telescope. Well, this thing is called the universal and it almost does it backwards. If you think about it, an excellent solar telescope is first and foremost an excellent telescope period. This one is an FPL 53 triplet, really good optics. It's an aprochromatic refractor. Well, then why don't we just build a solar telescope that is modular so that when you take out the solar pieces, you can put back on an astronomical visual back and you can use it at night like a normal astronomical telescope. That's right. This is a convertible. It's two telescopes in one. And I'm surprised nobody's thought of this before. So you can use it in the daytime, change it around, use it at night. This grants the possibility that you can be with your telescope round the clock. Life doesn't get any better than that, does it? Okay, so here's the scope as you get it, or in one configuration that you get it, but it's in double stack configuration right now. This is one etalon, the second etalon, and the visual back and the focuser for solar mode. The only thing I've changed here is I have swapped out the stock plate. This is the plate that came with the scope with a longer one. It gives me a little more range of options in terms of mounting, including I like to put an auto guider on the end of that. But otherwise, this is the way you're gonna get it. This round thing here is a carrying handle and it doubles as a finder. There's a little hole in the front here and a little screen in the back here. If you think about it, you don't want a conventional finder on this telescope for obvious reasons. So what you do is you just move the scope around until you see the red dot centered in the finder here. You'll know it's in the eyepiece. So the case here, the case is, it's okay. I, the, the quality of the case could be better. And also the case will not hold the telescope in uh, assembled, which is a little bit odd, and it won't hold the second etalon at all. 
So maybe a little bit uh, unsportsmanlike complaining about a case, but you know, at $8,000, I think we have earned the right to complain about such things. So this here, get this out, is the focuser for astronomical mode. This is in here, the diagonal for solar mode. This is the B1800 diagonal. It's the one that probably gets used the most often. We also have a calcium diagonal. And in calcium diagonal denoted by it being blue, as opposed to the H-alpha diagonal, which is red. This tells you what you're going to be seeing. In H-alpha mode, what you're going to be seeing is only a red view. And in calcium, you're going to be seeing a blue view. The calcium wavelength is just at the edge of human perceptibility. And some people cannot see anything at all. I'm one of them. When I use the diagonal, I can't see anything. I see the view is vaguely blue. But if you have better eyesight than I do at that end of the spectrum, you may be able to use the calcium diagonal. So this here is a conventional two inch diagonal for use in astronomical mode. And we have a, looks like an inexpensive inch and a quarter in case you want to do that. This is a Herschel wedge type device. I never even bothered using that, but it's here if you want it. So interesting to note here, you have one telescope, you have two focusers and five diagonals. So we've got the eyepiece here. This is a 27 millimeter, 53 degree eyepiece. It says it is optimized for 656 nanometers. I have no reason to doubt that. And this is one of the few cases where I never bothered to swap out eyepieces for anything else. I just used this one. There's also over here, a zoom eyepiece. It's 7.2 to 21 and a half millimeters. I don't love zoom eyepieces. I find these things, they never seem to be right, but maybe you'll like this. I use this a little bit. Uh, the field of view does change, which I find a little bit annoying in many zoom eyepieces. So let's go ahead and get the case out of the way and I'll show you how this thing goes together. Okay, so here's the scope getting ready to go together and I've taken it apart. This is the order in which things will go. We have the front of the telescope. This never changes. We have the first Edelon unit, we have the second Edelon unit, and we have the focuser. This one happens to be a very nice feather touch unit with the diagonal and the eyepiece in the back. So if you're going to put this together, you take the first Edelon, and this just goes in here like this. So if I have a minor complaint about the way this goes together, it's that these three screws here, and they're duplicated down here, are a little bit, <laughs> well, I mean, you can see a flange here, but the flange is pretty small. I've never actually had it fall out, but you kind of feel that it does because the, the gripping point of the, uh, the gripping area of these screws is actually quite small, and the flange area is quite small as well. So again, I never actually had anything fall out. I don't think it can fall out, but I have had this thing not quite tight to the point where it felt a little loose when I picked it up. Uh, if you want to see this type of arrangement done really well, check out the astrophysics. Their bayonet mount is, there is no question that you have that thing in correctly. So if you have it in single stack mode here and you don't have the second Edelon, that's fine. You can just mount the focuser in here like this. You could just use the telescope in single stack configuration like this. And this is how the telescope comes. This is the base $6,500 unit. But let's say that you do have the second Edelon unit like this. And this will then go in here. And the focuser then goes on the back like so. So this is the way you would use a sc the scope in double stack configuration. It is quite heavy here. You want to be aware of that. It's somewhere around 16 pounds, and it's also quite back heavy because the first Edelon in particular does weigh quite a bit, so you do need to pre be prepared for that on your mount. But just like this, you're ready to go. Okay, so now let's say it's nighttime. It's a nice clear night. You spent the day looking at the sun, and now you want to use it for astronomical use. Well, here's what you do. It's pretty simple. You take out the focuser and take out Edelon number one, take out Edelon 
number two. Like so. See the blocking filter in there. See that? And you take the astronomical focuser and you mount it in here like so. Now, this is not a feather touch. This is an, uh, an optional focuser that they have. I wouldn't worry about it. I don't know who they're using here. This is an outstanding focuser. I thought this was just terrific. There are compression rings in the back here. A little takes a little bit of getting used to. If you're not used to this, this is how you tighten. There are no lock screws. And then there are two diagonals here. We've got the two inch diagonal. We've got the inch and a quarter, whatever is your pleasure. And there you go. You have a four inch F7.7 triplet apochromatic refractor for use under the night sky. Okay, so the first few times you do this, you might be a little bit slow because just getting used to all of these parts fitting together. I think one thing that might surprise you is the weight and the bulk of this first Edelon unit here. But once you get going, this thing will be second nature to you. I have assembled and disassembled this thing well over 50 times already. So the other thing people sometimes ask me is, Ed, why do you always do this on the floor? And I have a very simple answer to that. When things are on the floor, they can't fall on the floor. <laughs> do this long enough and eventually you are going to have something fall on the floor and I would prefer that it not be an $8,000 piece of equipment. So here we are outside on this bright sunny day with our telescope. That's kind of a strange combination of words, isn't it? So here we have the Lunt 100 Universal on my Celestron AVX mount. The scope's 18 pound weight, a little bit pushing into my discomfort zone for this model, but you'll notice I do have the legs retracted all the way for maximum stability, especially since we have a bit of a breeze blowing out here. So if you've never done this before, I'm gonna point out a couple of things that might not be obvious to you the first time you go out and do this. Some of this is intuitive, some of this might be counterintuitive. First of all, polar alignment. How are you gonna do it? Well, there's all sorts of ways to do it, but obviously sighting Polaris in the polar scope is not going to be an option for you. Me, I just kind of set it down and I know approximately where north is. It's fine for this sort of application. I sometimes will paint white dots on the driveway and set the mount down there. It's usually close enough. Second thing, once you do get it polar aligned or approximately so, go into the controller if you have a go-to mount and set the rate to solar. It's pretty minor, but usually these mounts default to sidereal rate. It's just off a little bit and putting it into solar mode will be a little better for you in tracking. Next thing, and this one's counterintuitive, finding the sun. You think, well, this is the silliest thing. The sun is the easiest thing to find in the sky, but the first time you do this, you're gonna find maybe it's not so simple. So the way that I like to do this, and obviously there is no optical traditional finder on this thing for obvious reasons, I have a two-step process. The thing I do first is I turn my back to the sun and then move the telescope until the shadow on the ground is at its smallest. When I do that, I can look into this makeshift one power finder here where there's a hole in the top and there's a matte screen in the back. Usually there'll be a red dot somewhere on here. The field of view, so to speak, is pretty wide on this thing. And then you can fine tune with the hand controller. Okay, next thing, we're polar aligned. We have the mount set to solar mode and we have found the sun. You're going to need a glare shield of some kind. Now I've seen some of these contraptions some of you have made, they are quite amazing, but I do something fairly simple here. This is just a piece of craft foam I got at a hobby supply store. I cut a hole in it and I'll just put it on the front of the telescope like this. And this is enough. You're going to need a glare shield because obviously there's a lot of light around here and this is going to interfere with you looking through the eyepiece. I'll point out another obvious thing. Once you put the glare shield on, the finder no longer works, you're blocking it. So now that we're doing this, we can put the chair and look back behind the eyepiece to look through the telescope and you're gonna find very often the glare shield is not good enough. So what a lot of people do is they'll build, again, I've seen some really clever contraptions, almost like a ice fishing hut that people will put over the back of the telescope. But I do something pretty simple. I just get an old blanket like this and I throw it over myself. Okay, so if you want to image with the scope, you can take this, this is my trusty planetary imager, put it in the eyepiece and off you go. 
So, you know, I'd assume that my prior experience with planetary imaging, that is planets and the moon, would shorten the learning curve for me on this device, on the sun. It didn't quite work out that way. Imaging the sun is a different discipline altogether, and I had to relearn a lot of what I thought I knew. So here are some images that I took through this scope uh, at the sun. And as you can see, you know, I'm okay at this. I don't think I'm great at it. But we do have a club member named Herb, and he's made something of a specialty of this. And he is able to get some of these images. And as you can see, he is quite an accomplished solar imager. Some of these are quite spectacular. So also before I told you that I had trouble seeing any image at all through the calcium K diagonal here. And a couple of reasons for this, again, the calcium wavelength lies just at the edge of human perceptibility. And not only that, as we age, our corneas become yellowed and that interferes even more. The combination of the two means I don't see anything at all. But I had somebody come over and teach me how to see and with a little bit of coaching, I was able to see something through the diagonal. I'll tell you what I saw. It was a dark purple disc, much darker than I'd anticipated, silhouetted against a darker purple background, and that was it. Another member of our party said that he could see the disc and with some effort could see one or two sunspots third member of our group, somewhere around my age, but he had cataract surgery. And when you do that, that can enhance your ability to see in this part of the spectrum. And he said that not only could he see sunspots, but features on the sun and perhaps even some prominences as well. So if you do use the calcium diagonal, it's probably not going to be for visual use. It's probably because you're going to want to be taking images of the sun. And once I got used to this, I put the planetary imager back into it. So here is some live video of the sun through this planetary imager. This is a composite stitch of four individual frames to form the complete sun. I find that quite fascinating. And by the way, all sorts of interesting things can happen to you when you're doing one of these video captures. Okay, so I do wanna demonstrate one additional quirk of using the calcium K diagonal. If you're observing in H-alpha light, you have the H-alpha diagonal in here, and you have at least one and possibly two etalons in here, not only to tune the scope, but for safety reasons. But if you're going to put the calcium K diagonal in, you actually don't need the etalons. So, let's see if we can take this thing apart relatively quickly here. Etalon number two. Let's see on number one. And if you're going to be using the calcium K diagonal, you just get the astronomical focuser and then the calcium K diagonal just goes in the eyepiece like, like so. This, I mean, I have been conditioned in solar telescopes to always need the blocking filter in here, but you actually don't need this. The calcium K diagonal by itself is strong enough that you don't need any other blocking filters. So I do have a minor concern here that somebody who doesn't know what they're doing could in fact mix and match certain parts here and potentially create an unsafe condition. I found that whenever I was going to use the scope before I actually uncapped the lens and looked through it, I would just pause, stop, take a look. Does this make sense? Is this in a safe condition? So I'll also point out that if you're only interested in calcium K imaging, that is you're not interested in H-alpha, you're not interested in visual observing, you actually don't need to buy the scope. I mean, you only need to get this. You could put this in any telescope as long as it has a two inch visual back. And when some of the guys came over, I'll show you a picture here. This is the FS-102 and you can see this diagonal in the back there. You can put this on any telescope, again, that it has a two inch visual back. In fact, I wound up using this thing on the FC-76, the Sky-90, and the Stowaway. It's a lot of fun to use this thing and take images through it. And again, as stated, we can use this as an astronomical telescope at night with the astronomical diagonal in, like so. Put an eyepiece in the holder like this, and we are ready to go. So how is it as an astronomical telescope? Well, it's really good. 
FPL 53 triplet. I don't know why I'm surprised it's a good astronomical telescope, but it is really, really nice. The star test gives me absolutely nothing to talk about. Rings were concentric and identical on both sides of focus. No chromatic aberration that I could spot whatsoever. Nice, sharp, pinpointy, contrasty images, what you would expect out of a first-rate refractor. So I looked at a lot of the winter objects, the spring objects, the usual suspects. One night I had my friend Mike over and he's something of a double star aficionado and we went through some of these. You're going to be seeing some numbers and Greek letters coming up on the screen here. One thing I'll draw your attention to is Xi Ursa Major. That is 1.7 arc seconds on the tighter pair. That is very good for the changeable and unsteady conditions that we often have around here. Okay, what about astrophotography? Well, you can do that too. So they do make a dedicated field flattener for this model. I don't have that here, but I do have this generic AstroTech field flattener that I beat up on this thing a lot, but it's kind of unfair. It's only $150 and it's definitely worth what I paid for it. But I ran this on my camera and I took a number of astrophotographs. And as you can see here, this is M65. M66 and NGC 3628. This is the Needle Galaxy, NGC 4565. Here's M51. This is Globular Cluster M3. NGC 2174. This is sometimes referred to as the Monkey Head Nebula. Here is IC 410 and the Rosette. Like any good apochromatic refractor, the LUNT-100 is an excellent lunar telescope. These images I took were from a sequence over several nights. Each one of these you're seeing is a composite stitch of anywhere between two and four images. And when I was done, I was able to get this nice mosaic here. Okay, so do we have any complaints about all of this? Yeah, we do. It's mainly minor things. I mentioned the case before. Nothing really wrong with the case, but it's not quite up to the quality of the rest of the items that you see here. Some of the foam in particular is starting to fall apart from all the times I've pulled stuff out and put stuff back in. Also, the owner told me this didn't ship with any instructions. I don't know if that's normal for one of these models. I would think the instructions are pretty important here. Some people that came over even suggested perhaps etching the instructions on the parts themselves or putting a label so that you know exactly what needs to go together for which configuration. Okay, and finally, we should probably address this issue of the price. In this configuration, mid $8,000 range, and by the time you put a mount underneath it, if you don't have one, you could easily be well over $10,000 US. So I took a poll of the guys who were around here and I asked them point blank, is this too much money for this product? And it was interesting, the answer overwhelmingly came back, no, this is not too much money to ask for one of these. So bear with me for just a minute. So if you're gonna buy a four inch class H alpha telescope to look at the sun, whether you go Daystar, Coronado, Lunt, whatever, you're gonna pay $6,000 or so in that range, if not more, depending on what you want. H alpha telescopes are not cheap. Even the little 40 millimeter models out there are pushing $1,000 these days. But if you look at this, you're also getting an astronomical telescope. You're getting an apochromatic four inch triplet. And if you had to go buy that separately, you know, what are you gonna pay? We get a Chinese source version, it's gonna be 1200 to $2,000. If you go Takahashi or Teleview, you could easily be double that. And depending on how you shop things and what you buy, you could actually make the argument that you're saving money by buying one of these things. That sound you're hearing is a bunch of guys running to tell their wives what I just said. So there you have it, a look at the LUNT 100 Universal Telescope. You know, solar observing has always been a bit of a niche within our hobby. Hopefully convertible models like this one that are able to change into astronomical telescopes will entice more people to get into solar observing. Anyway, you probably know by now if you want one of these. I hope this review has been of some help to you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.